We were interviewing today Janine Peace, and very pleased to have you here. Thank you. Uh, we're interested in political histories and backgrounds, so could you uh, bring us up to date on your background and your political history? Well, you know, I uh, became quite interested in politics in the 60s when I was in high school. In the 1960s, of course, so much was going on. It was a, a very a time of great activity and change and transition. So I was a high school and college student in that era, and I became interested in the governor's campaign in the state of Washington where I was going to high school. And I helped campaign from door to door with the young Democrats in our county. I, I became very interested in individual candidates and, and the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party was the primary party in our little county in Washington state, was large in territory and small in population. And from that time on, I've just been very, very interested in the impact of government on people's lives. The war on poverty in particular caught my attention uh, because I was very, uh, very interested in the well-being of children and families. That seemed to be what I paid most attention to. That's what caught my attention. Also, civil rights and the status of uh, minority people in the United States. Myself being American Indian, I was very, uh, very drawn to the movement for civil rights uh, of all minority people. So the issues of children and family and minorities were what really caught my attention at an early age. My first job out of uh, college, though, I, I did a sociology and an anthropology degree. My first job was with the governor of the state of Washington, Governor Dan Evans, uh, a Republican. But he hired me as a director of youth affairs, or I'm sorry, assistant director of youth affairs. And I, I stepped into, I was supervised by the Secretary of State, his name was Lud Kramer. And they had started a youth commission, so you know, youth activism was huge, mm -hmm. as you'll recall. And so we did youth um, assemblies. We had youth commissions here and there around the state of Washington and I visited them. I had a youth newsletter that I published and uh, I was very fascinated by all of that. Worked in the legislature on the 18 year old vote when it actually passed and Washington was the 16th state to pass that. So I got in on the first, you know, on that very early in that movement I was not yet able to vote. I was 20 years old when I graduated from college and had this job. So I got in on the legislative aspect of it. I was very curious and I, I, I was able to present testimony on behalf of young people, on behalf of myself, both in Indian affairs and in um, youth, youth rights. And so I, I got quite a taste of that. Well, that's kind of where I got my start at an early age, right? That's kind of up to the age of 20. Now there's a lot more, but I'm not sure how much you really want to have in this <laughs> first question. <laughs> um, I really look at politics on a very local level. I look at it on uh, uh, how families are, how children are, how elders are, uh, how life is lived on a local level. I've never been interested in being a candidate. I've been interested in being a candidate maker identifying candidates. I've been a um, local committee person. I have been uh, chairman of the Dem county Democrats in Bighorn County. Once I moved to Montana in 1975, my democratic politics came here. And I became very interested, of course, in Montana. And I, uh, so I've been interested it, at that level. It's a very local level. Well, it has implications on a greater scale but I've, I've been very interested in how life is lived on a local basis. And, and you've been involved heavily in education. Could you give us a little... My profession is education. I'm very interested in higher education, especially in adult education. Uh, my, my view is on uh, equity of education. On, a fun, on the most fundamental basis, I see that education is one of those equalizers in society. If people have the opportunity for education, 
uh, then they have an opportunity for life. And life lived well. That's a basic fundamental belief that I, I hold. And so as an educator, my idea is that I contribute to that opportunity. And so most of my career has been devoted to higher education opportunities and the building of a tribal college at, on the Crow Reservation and helping other tribes actually build colleges, open college opportunity, that is higher education opportunity, both vocational and uh, professional type of, of training. Um, I have gone in the back door, however, to school-age children education a couple of different times in my career. And right now, I am very involved. I'm actually principal of a language immersion school for the Crow language, a kindergarten that we just started this year, full-day language immersion in the Crow language. So I never intended to be the principal of a little school, but it so happens that we designed it, and it was a competition that we were able to, to uh, successfully win a three-year grant, and we started our kindergarten this year. I'm very interested in curriculum. I'm interested in weaving the Crow language and culture into the standards of kindergarten, and next year I'll take on first grade. And I have studied a great deal about the education of children because of raising many children and now helping raise my great-granddaughter. But I'm very, very hopeful that this combination of things will be that educational equity that our people, our Korean people, our children need. How are you financing the language immersion school? We were uh, successful in competing for a Health and Human Services grant, and they have a, a department of children and families. It's called the Administration for Children and Families. And they have a subdivision that's called um, um, Martinez Language, Init Language Immersion Initiative. And so it, it comes HHS, the Administration for Children and Families, the initiative for Native American language. So that's our, our area for competition. And we were successful. I don't know how many people apply for it, but we won a um, million dollar grant for a three year period of time. So we started a kindergarten this year, we'll have first grade next and second grade the year following for full day language immersion. So what is... It's this? federal. What is, it, what is the state of Montana's role, if any, in Indian education? Well, the state of Montana has had some very important initiatives, particularly when they redid the Constitution in the 70, early 70s. I believe it was in 1972. Uh, because the Constitution notices and notes in its uh, preamble the unique quality of the cultures and histories of Native Americans. And since that time, our legislature has laid down a uh, fundamental right to, uh, Indian ch uh, to Indian children, to their history, their culture, and to their language. Uh, and there are several things that have developed as a result of that. Indian education for all is one area that was passed by our legislature. That in particular says that all Montanans should have the opportunity to learn about Native Americans, whether it's at kindergarten or whether it's at the 12th grade. And I myself have had involvement in that. Um, I have met with teachers at the higher education level who are training to be certified or recertified at the graduate level. Uh, I've presented classes and team taught those. I've been a guest in lectures. And I myself have helped develop lesson plans. Each of the tribal colleges were involved with uh, developing actually a volume of uh, the history and the culture and the language about their tribes. Oh. And so each of the seven tribal colleges had a legislative, legislatively appropriated funds to do a three-year contract to develop lesson plans at all various grade levels. So that's really exciting that our state has taken that initiative. Just a few states have done that. And I'm not as up on where other states, I know that South Dakota and North Dakota have recently joined that group. Um, 
but it's really important that all citizens, all children from all walks of life, all counties, all parts of our state have the opportunity to learn about American Indians. And so, of course, American Indian children will as well. And there's a couple of other initiatives that have been very important recently. Um, let's see, I believe it's 10 years ago, our state legislature, uh, with the leadership of our Indian delegates, the House, members of the House and Senate, set aside funds for language initiatives for the tribes. And so since that time, each tribe has had about $100,000 a year for language revitalization, whether it's the development of materials, working with children to learn the language, working at the tribal colleges and so on. And it's a variety of ways in which tribes have approached this. I myself am working on a grant right now on a digital dictionary for the Crow language with that funding. So yes, there's state funding in there. And that digital dictionary I see going right into our classroom with our kindergarten children using my great granddaughter who's five can use a digital dictionary online. She knows how to use the app and she does she uses it every day as we travel along. She listens to it and hears it and repeats it, and takes the tests and so on. <laughs> so the dictionary is an important part of our language revitalization. Now that's what we're doing this year. What we might do next year, I'm not sure. But we have ideas germinating. Yes. So that's what the state is doing. And the state, the state schools, the public schools are very supportive and uh, around the state, there are many of the public schools that have uh, language classes, and they have certified teachers to teach language by their eminent knowledge. And so, for example, in Hardin, we have probably six or seven teachers who are certified in the Crow language through that system. So the Office of Public Construction sets up a certification agreement with each tribe the tribe agrees to test and certify their each individual that might become certified in their fluency and their literacy. And so then they can those individuals can step into the school system and become certified teachers teaching in the middle school or teaching in the intermediate school or the high school. Oh. Yeah. Good. So that's a huge initiative of our state too. Not all states have that. Montana has had that for probably 25 years now. Good. Yes, it's quite a, it has quite a history, uh, 25 years. So, you know, I guess I'm, uh, those are some of the initiatives that Montana has, and I think they're very, very important for the vitality of the language and the culture of our tribes in Montana. Thank you very much.